冇開，喂，而家好似開完地面到啊，上網到上網出到啊，我咪，我咪得我咪，結果係。第四位啊！但係即係講啲網絡收得差第八位，啊、好個景點冇開咧第九位。係啊，嗰陣如果係行李唔見咗咧，都唔係好驚。實會數得翻俾你。係冇錯。最尾實話，即係你你喺航空公司裏邊都仲追到，我試過一次冇咗個行李，除非俾人偷，係嗰啲路位，除非俾個人攞咗啦。係啊。誒，我係佢寄失咗去另其他地方，第二日俾翻我。係啊。個已好快啦。係啊，第二日俾翻我，咁我就中間就要 mark 翻有啲咩損失，因為啲行李裏邊嘢我要買過，咁就要佢負責。係係。因為佢錯嘛。好，最後一個。啊、第三回合，开波！好，我睇，当地病咗要睇医生，无限 delay 开班。哎呀，呢个俾人打劫，结果系。大姐唔好讲住。哎呀，俾人打劫嘅第一位啊！当然系啊，系啊，我班，我班只呢第三位都好劲。第六位啊，爭啲啊，上個嗰個係第一位，我都以為係啊，所以我嗰個係啊 ，round 邊個邊個人啊？係啊 ，round 邊個人？係啊 ，round 就大哥贏，第二第二 round 係咩牌啊？即係第幾位？我真，我都第二位，即係我，因為我得調翻轉都出唔到贏咗啦，咁啊好啦，冇啦冇啦。
，雙方其後發生衝突，有人向警員投擲玻璃樽。梁天琦同黃台揚記喺示威者前線曾經高呼三二一去，衝向警方嘅防線，警員就施放胡椒噴霧，並且以長盾向前推進。亦都有片段顯示，幾名警員喺行車線同一批市民衝突，有人以雜物掟向警員，警員亦都制服咗部分嘅人士。亦都見到梁天琦向警員投擲垃圾桶。控方又話，片段顯示梁天琦襲擊在場嘅警員。盧建文嘅代表律師質疑，原審法官喺引導陪審團時有錯誤，唔應該將共同目的完全等同為同一種行為。佢話：當時現場人士有不同行為，即係俗語所講嘅兄弟爬山。律師又話：如果原審法官引導清楚，陪審團會唔會考慮現場人士正係進行緊選舉遊行？聆訊現時仍然繼續。香港電台記者任順希報道。港鐵今日重開大部分車站，七個車站仍然關閉，列車服務將會提早喺今晚八點結束。七個仍然關閉嘅車站，包括將軍澳站同埋坑口站等等。港鐵安排接駁巴士接載市民來往寶林站至調景嶺站，有唔少市民喺朝早繁忙時間輪候乘搭。有居民話，接駁巴士輪候嘅時間比起尋日短好多。咁亦都有市民相信，港鐵重開寶林站有助疏導人流。連倚婷報導。將軍澳線連日嚟都有多個車站關閉，寶林站今日就重開。朝早七點幾，唔少人喺寶林站排隊搭車，有職員用手提式拍卡機俾市民入閘。港鐵亦都安排免費接駁巴士來往寶林站至調景嶺站。中途停坑口站、將軍澳站呢兩個仍然關閉嘅港鐵站，喺坑口多名市民輪候上接駁巴士。居民徐小姐話：今日好快就上到接駁巴士，打消行去調景嶺站嘅念頭。琴日咧係轉咗好多個圈啊嚇，今日好咗好多啦，我我已經五分鐘都唔夠啦。係咪排咗半個鐘係做咗好遠好遠咁啦嚇？呢、这個冇辦法㗎啦，嗰啲人搞成咁樣，佢哋盡力以為㗎啦已經係嚇，佢哋做得好好㗎啦。佢同留班翻工嘅林先生相信，重開寶林站有助疏導人流。因為最主要係寶林站開翻咁樣，就搭接駁巴士過去嘅話，再搭地鐵就好快好多嘅，我覺得唔使塞車我最緊要係。本身係調景嶺嗰邊咧，因為最緊地面嗰個冇塞車，最主要係個問題。誒，而家開翻嘅話就會好多啦。将军澳一大道路，包括将军澳隧道公路同埋环保大道往将军澳隧道方向，朝早亦都交通繁忙。至于喺天水围站，已经恢复服务第二日，站内多部入闸机、部分升降机同埋扶手电梯仍然未能修复，繁忙时间人流比平日少。轻铁继续唔停天水围站。到牛头角翻工嘅卢先生话：搭港铁系希望避开路面塞车嘅情况。冇咗港铁之后咧，得翻巴士，所有人都去晒搭晒巴士。同埋條路多人用嘅話，一樣會塞車。咁隨時會變咗三個鐘頭先翻到公司。尤其是我哋由呢個香港最西邊去到最東邊。港鐵話，為咗騰空更多時間進行修復工作，列車服務將會提早喺今晚八點鐘結束。香港電台記者連以婷報導。自由黨黨魁中國軍對政府定立禁蒙憲法有保留，認為未釐清細節，引起更多摩擦。佢話：現時市況慘淡，比沙士金融改市時更差。有零售業代表估計，十一黃金週嘅零售表現會較舊年大幅倒退。黃貝文報導。政府上星期通過引用緊急法訂立禁蒙憲法，四十個建制派立法會議員聯署支持，其中未有聯署嘅自由黨黨魁中國斌喺本台節目《千禧年代》解釋。之前唔喺香港，所以唔了解条例，未有签署。但現時仍然对禁蒙憲法有保留，認为条文唔清晰，反效果多过正面效果。話現時并非适当时间定立法例。咩情况之下容許你大？咩情况之下唔可以？当然你警方就提嘅话，需要啲时间磨合。但我觉得有呢条法例更加多摩擦。你立一条法例，如果正常經過立法会嘅话咧，起碼呢个长时间嘅讨论，大家去睇清楚。解釋令到大眾市民或者甚至乎議員都可以知道點樣去處理呢件事。而家冇人知道嘅，即係總之你戴住面罩行出街，不定得唔知。中國斌形容現時市道慘淡，不論出口同本地消費都受到影響，比沙士、金融海嘯嘅時候更差。呼籲社會停止暴力。而家今時今日咧，就兩邊都死曬，既有內戰。咁你而家今日今時今日，你本地消費大家睇到。
，你沙士啊，就算點慘打，你都可以打開個門，睇下有冇客。你今日直頭係嘥埋曬，你想打開門做生意都唔夠。另外，零售管理协会主席谢钦安仪喺一个电台节目话，预计十一黄金周嘅零售表现会比旧年大幅倒退，又估计零售商铺将会出现倒闭潮。佢提到有部分街铺业主愿意共度时间，减租一成几至到三成，为期两至三个月。香港电台记者黄贝文报道。世界經濟論壇公布二零一九年全球經濟競全球競爭力報告，香港排名第三，較舊年上升四位，僅次於排第一嘅新加坡同第二嘅美國。不過香港喺司法獨立同新聞自由得分下跌，司法獨立排名跌至第八，新聞自由排名更加跌至第六十一位。調查喺今年一至四月訪問一百三十九個經濟體內。一萬六千九一萬六千九百多個商界行政人員，報告強調，數據係喺香港連串社會事件之前收集。特區政府歡迎香港嘅排名上升，強調一直致力提升香港經濟嘅競爭力同活力。政府會努力維護香港傳統優勢，包括優良發展傳統、司法獨立、自由開放嘅市場、簡單低税制、高效嘅公營部門。以及公平及方便嘅營商環境。美國政界領袖關注美國男子職業籃球聯賽 NBA 同中國政府就香港情況引發嘅紛爭。當中嘅參議院共和黨領袖麥康奈爾話：希望 NBA 可以學習香港人捍衛言論自由及人權嘅勇氣。內地央視主播強調，任何挑戰國家主權及社會穩定嘅言論。不屬於言論自由範疇，又形容體育頻道已經喺遙控器上面撳咗轉播 NBA 賽事嘅暫停鍵。謝允賢報道。美國國會參議院共和黨領袖麥康奈爾、參議院民主黨領袖舒默同埋前國務卿希拉里，先後喺社交專業留言。話支持香港人爭取民主，麥康奈爾話：香港人甘願冒住風險捍衛佢哋嘅言論自由、人權同自治權，體格比金錢利益更重。佢希望美國 NBA 可以學習呢份勇氣，為咗香港人堅持嘅底線，唔好放棄價值觀。舒默話：自己同爭取民主權利嘅香港人，同埋希望發聲支持香港人嘅美國人同一陣線，又話冇人可以禁止美國人為自由而發聲。希拉里就話。每一位美國人都有權發聲支持香港嘅民主同人權。事件起因係中國退役球星姚明以前效力過嘅 NBA 火箭隊，總經理莫雷日前喺社交專業貼文，內容係爭取自由，與香港一起。當單中國贊助商中指同火箭隊合作，莫雷事後刪帖同道歉。NBA 總裁亞當斯話：其後喺日本出席活動期間，承認事件對 NBA 係中國嘅商業活動已經造成影響。有傳認為 NBA 唔支持莫雷，但實情唔係咁。NBA 支持莫雷行使言論同政治表態自由。央視主播江強批評亞當斯話同莫雷都犯規，強調任何挑戰國家主權同社會穩定嘅言論不屬於言論自由範疇。我们以第二角度来说，在这个世界上有一种没有边界的言论自由，那对不起，我们也有遥控器自由。这不，对于 NBA 进行联赛等国赛的传播，央视体育已经按下了暂停键。江强所講嘅係央視體育頻道暫停轉播 NBA 季前熱身賽嘅決定，涉及 NBA 嘅一切合作交流亦要被立即調查。騰訊體育亦都宣布暫停轉播相關賽事。香港電台記者謝允賢報導。美國國務院對一啲中國官員及共產黨成員實施簽證限制，認為佢哋要對新疆自治區內拘留或虐待少數民族負責。國務院又表示，今次制裁。同今個星期恢復嘅中美貿易磋商無關。中國駐華盛頓大使館譴責係干預中國內政，強調新疆冇美國所指嘅人權問題。陳宇軒報導。美國國務院發表聲明表示，會對一啲中國官員同共產黨員實施簽證限制，認為佢哋要對新疆自治區內拘留或虐待少數民族負責。國務卿蓬佩奧強調，美國要求中國立即停止對新疆嘅鎮壓，釋放被捕嘅少數民族人士，以及停止騷擾、毀壞有關人嘅穆斯林。措施亦會影響被制裁人士嘅親屬，包括佢哋尋求到美國升學嘅子女。
，不過聲明中並冇提及受簽證限制中國官員嘅名單。有美國官員早前透露，特朗普政府考慮嘅對象包括新疆維吾爾自治區黨委書記陳全國。中國駐華盛頓大使館譴責美國嘅做法係干預中國內政，形容呢一項決定嚴重違反國際關係嘅基本規範，損害中國利益。中國深感遺憾，並堅決反對。發言人又重申，新疆地區冇美國所指嘅人權問題，美國所提嘅指控只係為干預捏造藉口。美國商務部日前將二十八個中國機構列入貿易黑名單，包括一個地方嘅公安機關，同埋視頻監控公司、海安威視等等，指佢哋涉嫌侵犯新疆維吾爾族人人權，以及使用高科技監控。由於海康威視係內地研發線上監控產品嘅龍頭之一，呢、這個時候被列入貿易黑名單，外界認為同中美今個星期重開經貿會談有關，但美國商務部重申係毫無關係。香港電台記者陳宇軒報道。英國首相約翰遜同德國總理默克爾通電話，首相府消息人士形容達成脱歐協議喺實質上已經不可能。我唔批評約翰遜玩緊愚蠢嘅推卸責任遊戲，反問佢唔想要協議，又唔想推遲脱歐期限，亦都唔想取消脱歐，到底想點？謝允賢報導。英國首相約翰遜同德國總理默克爾喺當地星期二朝早傾咗大約三十分鐘電話，討論約翰遜早前提出嘅新脱歐方案。英國廣播公司引述唐寧街十號首相府消息人士報導，兩國領袖通話之後，英國政府認為。成脱歐協議喺實質上已經不可能。呢名消息人士又指出，係默克爾喺通話中清楚表明，絕冇可能以約翰遜嘅方案為基礎達成協議。也較早前有其他報道引述首相府消息，指出默克爾提出一啲英方無法接受嘅要求。约翰逊嘅发言人话：，约翰逊确实希望达成协议，而要促成协议就需要欧盟引爆。但喺脱欧谈判中，英方未见到欧盟引爆，呼吁欧盟要有弹性。又话约翰逊已经话俾佢嘅内部官员知，英国仍然希望达成协议，同欧盟官员之间嘅技术谈判仲进行紧，并处于关键时期。有报道指出，喺欧盟内部，大家对默克尔同约翰逊通电话时，系咪讲过绝无可能呢类说话，保持。懷疑態度，歐盟有官員批評英國喺脱歐問題上玩緊愚蠢嘅推卸責任遊戲。歐洲理事會主席圖斯克亦喺社交專業發表致約翰遜嘅公開留言，表示處於危機當中嘅並非贏唔贏到愚蠢嘅推卸責任遊戲，而係歐洲同英國嘅未來，同埋歐洲同英國民眾嘅安全同利益。陶斯克反問約翰遜：你唔想要協議，又唔想推遲脱歐期限，亦唔想取消脱歐，咁究竟你想點？約翰遜嘅發言人回應話：推卸責任嘅並非英國。德國政府發言人證實，默克爾同約翰遜傾過電話，但就話唔評論領導人之間嘅機密對話。英國工黨批評約翰遜企圖破壞談判，又質疑佢根本一開始就想冇協議脱歐。工黨呼籲國會團結，阻止國家今個月底硬脱。香港电台记者谢允贤报道：美国国务院发出禁令，阻止美国驻欧盟大使桑德兰前往国会，就总统特朗普面对嘅通乌门弹劾调查作证。众议院情报委员会主席希夫对国务院阻止重要证人作证表示强烈不满。驻美国记者王丽诗报道。美國國務院喺最後一刻發出禁令，阻止美國駐歐盟大使桑德蘭前往國會就通烏門彈劾調查作證。國務卿蓬佩奧拒絕回應記者提問，但總統特朗普就透過社交網頁貼文宣稱自己樂意俾桑德蘭作證，但十分不幸，國會嘅委員會俾民主黨人士控制，共和黨成員被削去權力，令公眾無法獲知事實嘅真相。負責調查工作嘅眾議院情報委員會主席希夫對特朗普政府阻止呢一名重要證人作證表示強烈不滿，警告特朗普阻撓證人作證會被視作妨礙司法公正嘅強力證據。桑德蘭相信喺通烏門事件中扮演重要角色，負責安排特朗普私人律師朱利安尼與烏克蘭官員見面，討論調查拜登父子及解除凍結美國軍援嘅問題。基夫向傳媒解釋，調查人員知道桑德蘭曾經以私人電話及電郵同雙方溝通，而呢啲信息已經交咗俾國務院，但國務院拒絕交出俾國會做彈劾調查嘅工作。
but we are also aware that the ambassador has uh, text messages or emails uh, on a personal device which have been provided to the State Department, although we have requested those from the ambassador, and the State Department is withholding those messages as well. Hello 根廷全活引述国际足协报道已经被形容是令到外界忧虑高等法院开庭处理梁天琦的上诉环境保护署公布一般监测站的路空气质素健康指数是四至五健康风险水平中希望未来两三日大致天晴不炎热但高报地区有骤雨星期日骤雨较多天气转凉天文台录得现时气温廿九度相对于湿度百分之六十八不过今天的天气会员不香港电台五间财经财经财经财经财经财经财经财经财经财
跌啦，作為一啲客觀大人士，大家擔心金輪嘅談判咧，就未必有太多進展啦。咁至至於你話誒特朗普方面，大家都諗緊希望能夠做中國地再即係向中方咧作為一個啊外交嘅啊施壓力嘅手段啦。所以即係大致氣氛咧都係受到拖累。港股呢邊咧就即係近期啊啊都係大致維持喺一個區間上落啦，兩萬五千下到兩萬六千三度，咁誒即係算係唔係跌得太多，咁但好明顯啊，即係一啲香港香港比較相關重嘅股份咧，就壓力係比較大嘅，反而就一啲嘅中資股，特別係中資嘅消費股啦。就會相對、啊、表現比較強啲，咁啊呢、這個資金流向咧就形成咗、啊、一個好好明顯嘅強弱對比，咁似乎呢個趨勢咧喺港股呢邊咧都會繼續維持。咁睇翻中美兩國嘅誒、呃、爭拗啊、摩擦嗰方面咧，由貿易啦，之前又擴展到去一啲、呃、科技發展方面啊，譬如有關華為方面嘅一啲嘅。呃誒意見啦，另外亦都係見到咧喺人權方面亦都誒個摩擦好似又大咗啦。咁其實喺咁嘅背景之下，會唔會即係嚟緊中美貿易高級別談判？大家都唔好話有太大嘅期望啦，係嘛、呃？目前嚟睇就市場對呢一次嘅會面咧，能夠有一個實質結果出嚟嘅期望就應該比較大嘅，因為。即係始終最近嘅氣氛啊，同埋一啲事件啊發生啦，似乎雙方嘅關係又轉趨比較緊張。啊、希望就、啊、最終雙方喺會面之後都有啲比較、啊、即係、啊、平平和嘅信息啦，俾到即係市場可以緩和依方面嘅憂慮咁。但係暫時嚟講，我諗喺會面之前啦、啊，市場期望唔係太高啦，對整體個指數表現啦唔會有太大幫助。咁剛才你提到啦，咁見到一啲誒內地一啲嘅消費類股份咧，相對嚟講比較強啦。咁今日見到咧，內房股方面亦都做得係比較好嘅。咁啱啱完咗誒國慶假期啦，誒、呃、內房股誒做得比較好，見唔見到啲咩原因喺度？我諗就即係一來佢哋呢個板塊一路以嚟個估值都比較平啦，咁再加埋即係大入第四季啦，好多內房地都開始衝刺。啊，全年個銷售目標啊，同埋個業績表現咁啊，所以即係大家都睇啊，內地政策雖然針對內房咧啲調控政策未必會放寬啊，但係啊喺貨幣環境方面咧，即係啊人行持續比較寬鬆嘅貨幣環境咧，機會係相當高啦。咁呢個對資金比較敏感嘅流動行業都係有利嘅。咁啊喺而家比較低嘅估值之下啦，咁似乎有啲資金咧就開始留意翻呢個板塊啦，作為一啲追落後對象啊。咁啊～走勢短期都應該可以繼續睇好。好啊，國生台地方股份本身會持有價。誒、呃，冇嘅。多謝曬你嘅分析。恆生指數中午收市報二萬五千七百一十六點，跌一百七十六點，主板半日成交四百一十億三千幾萬。恆生指數期貨跌份報二萬五千七百二十一點，成交十一萬一千一百七十三張，跌一百四十六點。上證綜合指數中午收市報二千九百零九點，跌四點；深證成分指數九千四百二十三點，跌五十點。十大成交啊，港股中午嘅收市價，騰訊控股三百一十九個八跌四蚊，友邦保險七十二個七跌一個兩毫半，建設銀行六蚊升五仙，美團點評八十七個五毫半跌一個四毫半，匯豐五十八個一毫半跌三毫，盈富基金二十六個六跌兩毫，中國平安九十個半跌三毫半。恒生銀行一百五十九個六跌五個六，工商銀行係五個兩毫二跌一仙，港交所二百二十九蚊跌兩個二。今朝早五大升幅股份，中國疏進環保股份編號係八七一，之後係瑞遠智控、諾亞國際、金輪控股同埋礦文記。五大跌幅股份，中國資訊集團、正美豐業、音網易商。英英力投資同埋南華資產控股，外幣對港元賣價：美元七點八四四，英鎊九點五八三，瑞士法郎七點八九六，澳元五點二八九，加元五點八九二，新西蘭元四點九五四，歐元八點六零零四，每百日元對港元七點三二，每百港元對人民幣九十一點一二二，港金報一萬四千一百蚊，佢成日收市升。一百蚊，倫敦金每盎司買入一千五百零五點九九美元，賣出係一千五百零六點三三美元。美國聯儲局主席鮑威爾表示，好快會宣布向市場增加儲備供應嘅措施，將會再度擴大資產負債表，確保貨幣市場平穩運行。
有分析就認為唔應該提早。聯儲局在推量化寬鬆貨幣政策。羅偉浩報道。聯儲局主席巴威爾喺全國商業經濟協會發表講話，表示好快會宣布增加儲備供應嘅措施。佢指出，再度擴大資產負債表，確保貨幣市場平穩運行嘅時機，取決於聯儲局。但係佢強調，今次擴大資產負債表唔應該被解讀為刺激經濟，而係為咗滿足公眾對流動性嘅需求。近期因為短期資金不足。至聯邦基金利率大幅高於聯儲局目標範圍嘅上限，紐約聯邦儲備銀行需要推出回購安排，等市場注入流動性，降低利率。市場觀望聯儲局幾時以及推出啲乜嘢措施，避免短期資金供應中斷嘅情況成為常態。上海商業銀行研究部主管林俊龍認為，美國金融系統出現結構性問題，大型銀行唔願意派出資金，目的係為咗降低本身系統性風險，從而降低資本要求。佢相信聯儲局將會透過向市場增加短期資金供應，解決呢個情況，但係唔應該理解為重推量化寬鬆。夠買資產嘅衝動就比以上廣泛啦，即係尤其是我哋講緊啲按揭、抵押資產啦，傳統定義，聯儲局佢哋講嘅呢個叫叫以好傳統嘅講法咧，叫以控制一啲漲息嚟嘅。咁我哋而家咧就係控制一啲價嘢，即係就只不過係傳統嘅貨幣政策嘅誒調控嘅工具嚟嘅，就唔係叫以嚟嘅。佢哋想控制一啲比較短期嘅利率，咁可能喺譬如我哋購買相對嘅國債嘅年期都會比較短啲嘅，就唔係我哋講緊三年啦，就好長期嗰啲可能就未必行。另外，巴威爾話：全球面對風險，聯儲局都進一步減息持開放態度。佢喺發言中並冇明確承諾進一步減息，但係佢指出，過去一年聯儲局已經轉向一條更加低利率嘅途徑。聯儲局都以經濟數據為依據，逐次評估前景同埋面對嘅風險，採取適當行動。香港電台記者林偉浩報道。內地軟件商老大師公布香港支付結果。香港八十股份獲得超額仍舊超過二百七十六倍，公司啟動回撥機制，令香港八十股份數目相當於全球可供認購股份總數一半。投資者認購一手共一千股股份，中超比率兩成。老大師招股價每股兩個七，預計集資淨額大約一億零六百萬元。另外，內地運動服零售商滔博香港公開發售股份，錄得近一點四倍超額認購。投資者認購一手共一千股股份，全數獲得分配。滔博招股價每股八個半，預計集資淨額超過七十六億元。兩隻股份聽朝早喺聯交所掛牌買賣。六福金融主席兼行政總裁許兆忠就話：雖然近期新股市場比較活躍，但係大市氣氛低迷。即使百威亞太規模較大，亦未見太多散户參與。本地投資者嘅活躍程度已經降至最低，對孖展業務嘅正面影響有限。佢批評證監會實施嘅孖展新規，影響券商營運。普通散户嗰啲嗰百威嗰啲咁樣係咪有幾多散户申請？我唔相信好多散户投訴，因為大家都喺其他嘅情況之下都自顧不暇。我覺得嗰個今日嚟講嗰個投資者，本地嘅投資者喺市場嘅活動能力已經係降到係天時地利。我諗疫情喺目前階段應該係好低。即係呢個新嘅規例咧，有冇逼切性咧？從監管嘅角度睇咧，今日香港現今目前面對呢一個咁嘅明朗嘅動盪嘅因素咧，其實監管機構都幾驚。如果真係孖展品咧出咗問題咧，佢可能有好大責任。所以咧，從監管嘅角度咧，佢未必係錯嘅。但係從嗰個業界嗰個角度去睇咧，而家咁辛苦，大家都咩？突然間都一路以嚟都冇乜問題，都已經咁多年啦。你遲啲再諗，再搞啦，係嘛？求同存異啦，希望你兩方面都要證明啦。交通消息直擊報導。啲年港隧道情況啦，而家紅磡海底隧道港島入口告士打道東行過海排到新鴻基中心，西行就喺波斯富街堅拿道天橋過海啦。龍尾香港仔隧道嘅管道出口，九龍入口咁只係公主道過海有車龍啦，喺康莊道橋面路面情況喺港島方面，皇后大道中去中環近雪廠街一段擠塞，龍尾花園路口咁受爆水管影響，灣仔射飛道去銅鑼灣方向介乎柯布林。至到基隆門道啦，唯一行車線封閉㗎，咁車輛不能夠由柯布林道啦左轉去謝飛道啊，車輛不能夠由柯布林道左轉去謝飛道，喺九龍啦，波波打老道來回方向啊，近住彌敦道一帶咧都係擠塞，長沙環道旺角方向近住大南西街一段慢車啦，龍尾。亚皆路街去大角咀方向，近住弥敦道一段挤塞，龙尾窝打老道
加士居道天桥去大角咀，排到康庄道桥底。咁再提一提你啦，咁港铁咧今日关闭咗七个车站噶，观塘站、旺角站、将军澳站、坑口站、车公庙站、沙田围站啦，同埋石门站。最后卫生署提提你，要远离烟酒，少食盐油，多菜少肉，日日运动，健康精灵之选，就系、是、咁简单。好啦，下节时间通消息，再见。以市民心为心，以天下事为事。香港九二六，香港电台第一台，你嘅新闻时事知识台。文化与生活，生活在于体验。年轻人点样旅行，点睇文化？不如跟住我哋一齐出发啦！电视节目《文化长河》江山行，我张曼莎。我马晓晴同埋杜慧瑶会带观众游历中国，以青春嘅眼光细看历史，认识中华文化。Amid protests over corruption and unemployment, the social media and much of the wider internet have been blocked in the country over the last week or so. But autonomous Kurdish regions in north of Iraq have not been affected. Connectivity in Iraq itself has been restored once or twice. So, what's the situation now on Tuesday evening UK time as this show goes on air? Well, the organisation Netblocks observes outages around the world. I've been speaking to Executive Director Al Toka, who has been giving me the latest. It started out as a social media block. We, we measured、uh, blocking of Facebook, Twitter, WhatsApp, Instagram,、uh, but that transitioned to、uh, what we call a near total outage in affected regions, which means that really you have no connectivity. You also have no way to work around the restriction. You are really disconnected from the world. And that's interesting that you say there's no way of working around because often when we have these internet blockages, we hear of people using these things called proxy servers. There are other ways of circumventing the closure. As far as you know, that's been less of a feature this time. Well, that's right. There's a huge emphasis on circumvention or VPNs and tunneling. But when we look at internet shutdowns, we're looking at something far more desperate, something far more extreme. It's really a very abrupt means. Of cutting off entire populations from the world. When this happens, it's quite possible that others outside the country don't actually know it's happening. We've seen instances where entire countries have gone offline, and really, people are none the wiser because it's such a severe problem. And because we're so used to gathering news from social media, you know, if you, if you don't hear about this, it can really take time to increase awareness and let the world understand. For many of us who just take for granted that most of the time we can get access to the internet, it's hard to even imagine how the authorities, if they want to, can close it down. I mean, do they have a big switch that they flick? How do they actually do it? It's interesting. You hear this, this legend of the internet kill switch. In fact, there are very few instances of a real internet kill switch. If we look at Iraq, we see a very diverse network. We see many different providers, many different companies which supply internet access. It's actually quite difficult to get all these networks disconnected. So it's, it's a very messy process. It's a process where orders are sent to companies. Companies might might refuse to switch off the internet in case, and、uh, it, it, it takes time. But with enough pressure, legal pressure, or just direct orders from up above, eventually the internet goes down. Do we know how sporadic it's been? So we had these protests on Wednesday last week. You say, as you speak to us now, that the internet is down again. But has it been coming up occasionally and then going back down again? Yes, we've seen.、Uh, we're now on the fifth outage. So that means there were four periods when the internet has come on briefly. Each of these have been for a slightly different reason. The first outage happens when Prime Minister Abdul Mahdi gave a speech. Internet was switched on. About an hour prior to the speech, but they actually had to switch off internet again because the videos were, were being posted to the internet, showing the, these cases that appeared to show violence and, and in case of atrocities、uh, being committed. And you know, clearly it, it wasn't. You know, so the prime minister's speech wasn't Trump's in that case. The third outage also was during the President Sali's. Beach, and in that case, it stayed on a bit longer, six hours. Now, interestingly, the autonomous Kurdish regions in the north of Iraq that have a different governance, their internet seems to have been unaffected. That's right, and it's not by accident. The leadership、uh, released a statement saying that they were actually ordered by the Iraqi central authorities to switch off 
internet, and they point blank refused, which is which is great, really. They do have their own governance; they're semi-autonomous. But this has been a conscious decision to keep a population connected. In a way, it, it, it's something that, um, that this community has had the option to do. Other other centrally governed communities haven't had the option to do. But being able to measure that, monitor that early on, certainly helped to inform the world. Because initially there was all about confusion about whether the whole country is off, whether whether parts of it are on, are on and, and mapping has been really important in that respect. What do you think needs to be done now, if anything, to maybe prevent this kind of political management of people's right to uh, information and to connectivity? It's, it's an extreme and universally disproportionate measure in, in, in almost any conceivable condition to actually switch off the internet for a country or most of a country. And the shocking thing is, is there are very few legal recourses. Uh, there's a UN resolution which tends not to uh, teeth. Often the country's own constitutions uh, don't actually allow this kind of restriction. But authorities will do it anyway, they'll cite security measures. The trouble is, when you look at uh, how these events unfold, you see that shutdowns tend to actually cause more violence, they cause frustration. And there's been research done around this that shows that actually shutting off the internet will actually make people more angry and will cause more of an uprising. So it tends to be a terrible policy. That's out to care for now. Uh, Glenn Bollington is here. The, 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 this is changing all the time when the yeah, internet is yeah. all wrong. Yeah. But people are finding all kinds of ways around these restrictions, aren't they? You can they are, and I think it links it to um, the, the, the last part of that interview where actually access to the internet is more and more of a human right, and therefore for people having access to critical debate and other views is really important. So. Um, I know there's this group called IBB, Ideas Beyond Our Borders, who are teams of students, etc., translating uh, important Wikipedia pages, which would be science, literature, other things, to make them available for Arabic speakers. And in this present situation, what's happening is those are being created into PDFs, they're being printed out, and they're being handed out on the street, yeah, because there is no access to them online. So. And there isn't enough Arabic um, on the web anyway, even though many people in the world are speaking that language and those languages around it, there's just not enough Arabic. So the translation side is very important. But you think about this in terms of actually that human rights side and freedom of speech, curtailing that is really definitely part of the digital is part of it now, holding people back. Mm, okay, yeah, and that's something that we will keep an eye on for sure. Galen, thank you. Um, now, if you're left-handed, you must often say, why don't they make more devices for right-handed people? In that case, you should read Kat Holmes' book. It's called Mismatch, How Inclusion Shapes Design, because that and many other examples are bound to resonate. So, Kat, tell us about Hello. some of these. Hello, I should say. I'm forgetting my manners. <laughs> Thanks for coming in. I'm Welcome so to the to studio. Here. Welcome to the BBC. Thank you. So, just give us some examples of products that are just not inclusive, but the design's just been rather marish. Oh, not inclusive? I thought we'd start well, with make, inclusive. Make it inclusive. You can start, start with positively or negatively. I'll start with the positive okay. examples. There are examples of inclusive design everywhere around us. It's products that were designed mission with or by people with disabilities in particular. Um, if you think about keyboards, the first keyboards were created by an Italian inventor and a very close friend of his who was blind. They used it as a way so she could author her own letters when they were Part. Uh, electric toothbrushes, audiobooks, um, there's a long list, even email. The first protocols were created by Vince Cerf, and uh, he's hard of hearing, and his wife is deaf, and they used it as a way to communicate when he was at work. So I love thinking about all these kind of quiet heroes of inclusive design in our everyday environment that started out as a very focused solution for someone, and then became a solution that we all benefit from. Yeah. And Glenn, you had a glance at the book as well, and, uh, yes, and yes. obviously it's, we, we all agree, I mean who wouldn't, that you know, if you're designing products, it's nice if most products are usable by most of us. Yes it is, and I think we're, it, we're moving into a world in a time when we have to um, actually use inclusive at, at the base of the core basis of design principles. Um, so really, there should really we've been appointed that when no product should be made without them being utterly inclusive and uh, based, and used by everyone. And I know the gaming world's looking at this a lot. The mm -hmm. product world, you know, you know, much more, much more debate in the design sector about this. But you're really right; it's about with, yeah, work designing with. 
with people who have been excluded historically or who have experienced exclusion in using a product. And of course that could include anybody, you know, just you break your leg on a ski, you're having a skiing accident or something like that, and then suddenly you're in need of um, devices that may be designed for people with, with disabilities. I love how you're saying that because um, the World Health Organization tells us that uh, over a billion people in the world have some kind of disability, 20% of the population. But it also means that over 6.4 billion people are temporarily able-bodied. And at some point we all experience exclusions, particularly based on our abilities or our changes in disabilities over the course of our lives. Yeah, sure. The number of times that you've just got your hand in a bandage or for something and you're just thinking, why can't these products work for me if I can only use one hand? Or people when they have a, a child, for instance. So Absolutely. you need a, one hand for the baby and then you, you really wish more devices can be used. Absolutely, and as you come in and out of a building, I encourage you to take a notice of the doors that you encounter. Often the handles on there may have been designed first for somebody who may have them with you, so maybe only one hand. But you're benefiting it as you're carrying a cup of coffee or a bag of groceries yes. as well. So it's permeating everywhere in our environment. And of course people's needs change. And you have a lovely example in your book of a Puerto Rican astronomer who I think became blind and needed to find other ways of looking at the data set. So just set one Absolutely. Um, so the uh, very classic way of interacting with data is by visualizing it, being able to see it in great charts. As she uh, lost her ability to see, which is really you know looking for a way to continue right. her practice. Yeah. Um, so she applied sonification, uh, sound instruments to the data that she collected. Wonderful. We can hear some. Star songs. Yeah. And what? Oh my goodness, I love it. Isn't that lovely? It sounds like a very elaborate piece of harp music. Yes. But this is sound that has been derived from these data sets that this the type of radiation one that Diaz Mes said analyzes. Absolutely, and it's applied um, in a way that she got an access to a different kind of nuance even in the data. Um, in a way that other astronomers are now applying that sonification to their data so they can both visualize and hear it at the same time, giving them another layer of understanding of the data that they're collecting. Right, so so finally then, if you, you, this is your chance on the BBC to give just one really important piece of information or advice to any company that's designing any product to be usable for all of us. Is there one overarching thing they should have in mind? I would absolutely start with learning how to recognize exclusion in the products that you create, the environments you create, starts by engaging communities you may not have considered before. Let go of the idea of the average human and find who's missing from your the voices that you're contributing to your product and bring them close to heart. That's good advice to end with. Cat Holmes, that flew by, didn't it? But thanks so much thanks so for much. coming in. Nice to meet you. And uh, yeah. still to come, a hopefully inclusively designed solar powered car. We're going to talk about that in a few moments. But uh, first, it's part music video and part protest song. That's how musician BT Wolf describes her exhibition, currently underway at London's Barbican Gallery, where today, Tuesday, there's also been a screening of a documentary about her work. She's distilled 800,000 years of historical data into a visualization of the carbon dioxide in the Earth's atmosphere. But alongside the visuals, there's also song, as Gillen and I found out a little earlier when we visited the exhibition. Outside the people, like cars are still running. When inside it's safe to deny that it's coming. TV's turned up, so the winds are just humming to the sound. We have the song 2006 Greens of Red, and you're in a way bringing that together with the data visualization of climate change. <laughs> yeah, summarize that for us. I know it's, there's quite a lot going on here. So, I saw An Inconvenient Truth in 2006 when it came out, and I was just incredibly moved, but also really angry, you know, by what was displayed in this film and how we'd let it get to this point. And so immediately after I wrote this song from green to red, which represented a lot of the information and also my emotions around it, but I felt I didn't need to record it because I thought everyone would see the film and then, you know, we as a human species would sort of figure this problem out. But then when I realized that wasn't going to happen, I recorded it and actually it became part of the second album, Montague Square. So now here we are in the tail end of 2019. And it seems to me that you're bringing together the emotion of the song, the anger about climate change, with the hard, and I suppose unemotional, data of carbon dioxide records going back quite some time. Yeah, I think that particularly with From Green to Red in terms of the last cycle of this incarnation, 
you know, it was just this song. And then I was thinking, and even in the last six months to a year, you know, how the problem has really been amped up sort of tenfold. And I just felt like art is at its best when it's reflecting the best of humanity, but also something of our divinity. But right now, I don't think there's any more important issue than the planet and what we are doing to it and what we've done to it. And so I really wanted to create a way of visualizing that that people could get their heads around because a big issue is that it seems so abstract and so vague and so subtle that it's quite easy to dismiss and for people to kind of not get emotionally engaged. Right, so this is 800,000 years worth of data picked up from ice cores in the Antarctic and uh, data that you're interpreting then. So as people go into the installation, what will they see? What will they feel and experience? So the idea with this piece is uh, it's using 800,000 years of historic data, as you mentioned, predominantly looking at CO2 in the atmosphere to create a sort of live weaving of the planet's timeline that people will be able to interact with and really interrogate as they get closer they'll be able to look into the threads and see what's going on there there'll also be the lyrics that are woven in which you know the, the music the song so it's on the one hand this protest song on the other hand a music video but also this entirely interactive timeline of the planet's co2 atmospheric content so you're bringing a whole load of tech here and i know this is work in progress but ultimately you're going to have movement sensors that will pick up how people are interacting with the space you'll have screens that will be displaying or projecting the climate data so it's a data visualization movement and all being driven by a games engine isn't it yeah and i think a big component of it as you mentioned is that element of audience participation in terms of you know they'll be able to um, really go into that fabric to look at these key moments in history and look at what's going on sort of behind the scenes. You'll also have these sort of shadow images of other factors that are coming out of the cloth uh, in addition to the CO2 inputs. And in addition to that, the music as you get further away will get foggier, the mix of the song will change. So people will also be able to sort of live mix the track with their bodies. Again, so, looking at this teaser that you're showing us today, and actually starting to imagine from your descriptions this larger interactive piece, I'm really aware that it's so important that we're demystifying these kind of huge, big, big data sets of facts, which are very, very hard for all of us on a daily level to get our heads around and seeing the images it's coming out. It sounds like um, with the information and data right in it, and people being able to go right in it, there will be a lot to share there from the facts, the facts that you've gathered. And are you hoping to show that into different arenas than, I mean, obviously here we're in an art setting, but I'm thinking about the width of access to this work in relationship to the width of interest there is, um, you know, looking at extinction rebellion, all the climate change movement around. Every time this is shown, wherever it shown uh, the context of the environment would be incorporated into the piece so it really feels as if it's this live painting within that setting. It would be very wonderful I think if it could go into large screen or public facade scenarios too which actually possibly couldn't react in exactly the same way with the amount of motion and the crowd motion but could be done through block tracking or whatever to actually create shifts changes in it from crowds but then allowing a much bigger set of people to get their heads around this because it really does help I think this visualization data visualizations made in this way can just click in your head and you go that's how it is that's how really awful this is how much it's growing in this case yeah and as an innovator of course you famously and notably created a musical jacket where the strands are actually made up of your songs so it's making a materiality out of your music in this case, we have the song Green to Red accompanied by a virtual fabric, if you like, that actually goes from green to red on, in the screens as you go around the interactive. The green sort of strands represent the, I suppose, pre nicer, happier, pre-human yeah. carbon dioxide levels. Okay. Yeah. And, the, and then the Anthropocene kicks in, human influence on the planet, and that's the red. Absolutely, and it's you know it's also that idea of trying to show the difference between 
weather and climate and really have, having people understand that you know we've been here for such a short amount of time compared to the planet's overall timeline and yet we've done so much devastation and how do we grasp that when you know the timeline is so huge there's the question that BT will ends with talking to Space Bus yesterday. Yes, you know. yeah. And interesting looking at timelines, you know, we've just said Happy Ada Lovelace Day today. But in fact there, the influence of the Jacquard loop is weaving again. Oh, yeah, it's used data is woven, isn't it? It's these visualizations. Totally woven. Twenty four thousand punch cards used, which actually was the weaving machine that influenced the development of the analytical engine. So it all links up in these long timelines. Oh, you wrote that in. Yeah. And I love the weaving, weaving into digital. She's right in the right place, BT. What a pro. Thanks, Gillette. Well, finally, this is a car you wouldn't want to put a roof rack on this particular car uh, because um, it might disrupt the car's sporty lines, but most of all, it would probably obscure its power supply, solar panels. Now, here I'm talking about the Lightyear one. It's a prototype car at the moment, but if all goes well, then it uh, should end up on the road. People are already reserving these cars. And it gets around a couple of the snacks with existing EVs, that electricity at the charging point is not necessarily generated in an environmentally friendly way, and that roadside charging point actually can be quite expensive. And now this particular electric vehicle claims to have a range of 720 kilometres, so that's about 450 miles, and has recently been on show at an event for future cars near the city of Chichester in the southeast of England, from where Tom Stevens now reports. Goodwood Festival of Speed, an immense car show celebrating the latest advances in motoring and racing technology. The show is an important annual fixture in the calendar of car fanatics worldwide, and at almost any point during the festival, it's possible to hear at least one high-powered engine roaring around one of the stunt courses or racetracks. But some companies have brought more humble new technologies to the festival, and I met one man who told me about a new car that's powered not by petrol, but by the energy of the sun. My name is Lex Hufslo, I'm a CEO and co-founder of Lightyear, and what we do is we're developing the first long-range solar car. Lex and the rest of the Lightyear team have a booth at the festival in which they're showcasing the solar-powered car, which has been named Lightyear One. Lex and I sat down in the car to chat, and he told me that the origins of the company can be traced back to an event that shares the high-octane nature of the Goodwood Festival of Speed, solar-powered racing across the Australian desert. So we did races in Australia, 3,000 kilometers through the desert. So the races you do there is drive as fast as possible using just solar power. So what we did is applying that mindset to a consumer car. A solar powered car with a range as large as 450 miles, as Lightyear claims, would have been utterly impossible only a few years ago due to a myriad of factors, from the low efficiency of available solar cells to the materials used in the assembly of the car. But Lex tells me that an exciting array of recent technological developments have allowed for the construction of a car that generates as much electricity as it consumes. We have super efficient solar cells on the roof and the hood of the car, that's about 5 square meters. And those cells, if you look back about 10 years, then they become about 20% more efficient. So that means that actually it's 20% more kilometers to drive on the sun. But at the same time, batteries go lighter, you have different materials like carbon fiber you can use to decrease the weight of the car. And all of that really got us to a point that you can actually match energy consumption of a car with energy yield from the solar cells. And that's a magical moment because then you have independent energy in the car itself. But the need to maximize the car's efficiency is not only evident in the new technologies and materials incorporated into its body. Every element of Lightyear One has been carefully tailored in an attempt to create a vehicle of ultimate efficiency, from reducing heat loss in the gearbox to the car's sleek and aerodynamic exterior. We have in-wheel motors, that means we don't have any gears. No gears means no heat loss. When you look at the motors, we use them not only because they're more efficient, but also they have to give us a lot of design space in the middle of the car. And we leverage that to improve the aerodynamics of these vehicles. And we get to uh, aerodynamic coefficient that's lower than 0 0.20. And that's actually it's better than any other car on the road. So it's all down to using every ray of sun to try to power the car. Although Lightyear is currently taking pre-orders for their first 500 cars for well over 100,000 euros, Lex told me that the aim for the company's future is to follow the Lightyear 1 with much more affordable models with similar solar-powered capabilities. 
when you look at the components we use, uh, they're not necessarily expensive from a materials point of view. We expect the technologies we use to be much more affordable in five to ten years. And actually, you can build these cars more affordable than the cars we drive right now. And on top of that, of course, the usage cost is really zero. Maybe you have to charge a bit in the winter. But uh, apart from that, uh, it is very low operating cost. So it means that you can drive cars in the future for a lot less than you do right now. And Lex hopes that light years position as outsiders to the car industry will galvanize larger changes and moves towards sustainable motoring within the industry itself. Our goal, why we find the company, is to make an impact. The industry has a lot of constraints, so their brand is constrained, their technology is constrained, their plans where they build the cars are constrained. And we need competitors from outside the industry to show that different things are possible to drive the industry. So I'm very glad to see all those startup companies doing this as well. Uh, we're not the only ones really pushing, pushing technology. That's Lex of Slow to Move is talking there to Tom Stevens. So good end, Bollings, listening to that. And they really do want to push the technology. And, and of course, you know, we wouldn't be enthusiastic about the idea of powering cars by renewable energy. But this surely would have to be part of the way of energy mix. Yes, I agree. And I think, you know, I'm, you know, I'm totally fascinated by and want a lot more to happen. We've got these natural sources, wind, solar, and wave, and I've always been those this. I mean, it's getting better. But, and it's great, you know, the perfect solution for sunny climes, I guess, but maybe not so great in British house. But I think it's the hybrid that's got to come through in this, isn't it? We need to have. There's an intermediate. Yeah, there's an intermediate. So, you know, a solar powered car, which also can have an electric top hat. Uh, and I wonder if that, that is part of the solution. So right, in between yes. EV points, then the, the solar at least extends your range. And of course, you will work in cloudy environments, but inevitably yeah, better yeah. suited to the middle latitude. Yeah. Well, it inevitably doesn't need to garages, doesn't it? Because it just wouldn't put us in a garage. Charge in the garage. Good <laughs> point, Gillen. Mean, good for citizen use. Gillen Boddington, thank you so much for that. We need to be out of here. The producers, and you look to over to my garage. You're listening to the Mini Sea World Service, and here's what's happening in the studio this week. Glasses of colour and swirls of neon are beginning to light up the traditional dark streets of the U.S. capital city, Havana. The artist, Adir Lopez, has been fascinated by neon for many years. He and a small team of experts are now making the signs of new art buildings and hanging them above the boulevard. In the studio at bbcworldservice.com slash in the studio. And at bbcworldservice.com, 50 things that made the modern economy so hard for it goes back to the 1920s in the era of prohibition in the US. He discusses if the idea of the rational criminal can explain why the band was so widely planted. Next, it's Newsday here on the BBC World Service, the world's radio station. London. Hello and welcome to the World Service Newsday with Lawrence Pollard and Kelly Shark. Nine pages to say no. Uh, the White House has sent a letter to say it will not cooperate in the impeachment probe against President Trump. Uh, it's, un it's unconstitutional, they say. Well, is it? Brexit talks between London and Brussels reach a new low with just three weeks to go before the UK is supposed to leave the European Union. We hear about the so-called blame game. Also, following on from uh, yesterday's advice on this program on what to eat for breakfast and still save the planet, we hear about a sustainable farm in the US with cows that can help fight global warming. And in Spain, they, are, they could start eating parakeets because they're culling them, we find out how these unwanted recent rivals have been targeted for sterilization. We'll also have the latest sports and business news that's coming up after the latest world news. Hello, I'm Neil Nunes with the BBC News. The White House has said it will not cooperate with the impeachment inquiry launched by Democrats in the US House of Representatives, calling it partisan and unconstitutional. The announcement came in a letter to senior Democrats, as John Sopel reports. The letter from the White House lawyer to leading Democrats crackles with defiance. Never before in our history has the House of Representatives taken the American people down the dangerous path you seem determined to follow, wrote Patchy Maloney. It's true the Democrats haven't followed tradition by holding a vote at the full House to launch the investigation. 
that there's little in the Constitution or law that sets out how an inquiry should be conducted. And so Democrats have reacted with equal fury. They accuse the President of threatening national security in his contacts with the Ukrainians and of undermining the integrity of US elections by asking a foreign leader to dish the dirt on the former Vice President and Democratic Party hopeful Joe Biden. A spokesman for President Recep Tayyip Erdogan has said the Turkish military and the Free Syrian Army will cross the Syrian border shortly. Bahreddin Altun said Kurdish militants there could either defect or Ankara would have to stop them, as he put it, disrupting Turkey's struggle against Islamic State militants. It follows President Trump's surprise decision to withdraw U.S. troops from the area, paving the way for a Turkish operation to move into Kurdish-held territory in North. Syria. Meanwhile, Kurdish-led Syrian Democratic forces say they have come under attack from Islamic State fighters in the city of Raqqa. The Irish Prime Minister Leo Varadkar has said it will now be hard to reach a Brexit deal in time. His remarks come ahead of a meeting later this week with his British counterpart Boris Johnson. Jonathan Blake reports. In a bleak assessment of the Brexit negotiations, Leo Varadkar said it would be very difficult to secure an agreement by next week said he would work until the very last moment to secure a deal but not at any cost and he accused the UK of putting half of the deal negotiated by Theresa May back on the table and claiming that was a concession. In an interview with the French newspaper Les Echos, the President of the European Commission Jean-Claude Juncker said he did not accept that the EU was to blame for the failure of the negotiations. If the talks do fail, he said, it would be the UK's fault. The champion Australian trainer Darren Ware has been charged with animal cruelty offences after electronic devices used to shock horses into running faster were discovered during police raids on his stables. Mr Ware was already banned from horse racing for four years after taser-like devices known as jiggers were found in January. He trained the Melbourne Cup winner of 2015, the Prince of Penzance. World News from the BBC. The president of Ecuador, Lenin Moreno, has declared a nighttime curfew around government buildings in the capital, Quito, as protests against austerity measures intensify. Police earlier had to clear the National Assembly after demonstrators broke through police lines and invaded the building. Tens of thousands of people from indigenous groups and trade unions have converged on Quito for a major demonstration planned for Wednesday. This protester urged Mr. Moreno to resign. We're here because of the struggle for the indigenous people because we're fighting against this inept president. Go, Moreno. Go. Take him away. We do not want him here. Inept. Corrupt. Go. Twitter has apologized for unintentionally using email addresses and phone numbers provided by users for account security to enable targeted advertising. The company said third-party marketers may have been able to reach specific users on Twitter based on contact details, even if the user had not wished the information to be used this way. Conservationists are calling for more to be done to save emperor penguins in Antarctica. Scientists have estimated a significant fall in their numbers as sea ice melts because of global warming. Here's Jonathan Amos. Emperors are the least of the penguins, but their need for nine months of stable sea ice on which to free up their young means they face an uncertain future. Climate models project large sea ice losses, with them perhaps a 50% reduction of the emperor population by 2100. Scientists who study the birds believe it's time their particular vulnerability was formally recognized. They want to see measures taken to ease other pressures faced by the emperors, such as the fishing activities that impinge on their food supply. ABC News. And a very warm welcome to Newsday. Thanks for the latest. Uh, Brexit's back. Rob Watson will join us to explain why there's game as British proposals appear to be rejected. We talk about cows and birds in the next half hour as well. Uh, the cows that could help save the planet rather than heating it up with their emissions. The cows get a lot of blame for seeing climate change. And the monk parakeets being targeted in Madrid. They are pretty tourists. Why are they being targeted for sterilisation? Now we've got the sport. Matthew Kenyon and Super Chat will be here with the business as well. Dying morning. World Bank.
U.S. President Donald Trump has treated in displeasure. He's talking heads have rubbished it. Now the White House has said officially that it will not cooperate with the impeachment inquiry against President Donald Trump, uh, launched by Democrats in the U.S. House of Representatives. A letter sent by the White House's legal team to Democratic leaders rejected it as baseless and constitutionally invalid. Speaking to reporters, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi said the White House was an abuse of power. Not any of us went to Congress to impeach a president. This is very serious for our country. The president is obstructing Congress from getting the facts that we need. That is an abuse of power for him to act in this way. And that is one of the reasons that we have an impeachment inquiry. Now, three Democratic-led House committees are investigating Mr. Trump. Just to remind you, the inquiry is trying to find out if the president held back aid to Ukraine uh, to push Ukraine to investigate Joe Biden, who, of course, is running for the Democratic presidential nomination. Uh, I spoke earlier to Stephen Zunas, a uh, regular guest on this program, professor of politics at the University of San Francisco. The White House is saying that the demands are unconstitutional. Uh, or actually, is it the refusal to pay ball that's unconstitutional? By refusing to uh, allow the people to testify and refusing to uh, turn over required documents, I mean, that is, that we consider to be obstruction of justice, which in itself is an impeachable offense, which of course further raises suspicions as to um, the uh, possibility they have some pretty serious things to hide. That, right, that's what the, the, the man and woman on the street might assume. Um, politically, how does this play out? Because when they make a statement saying, you are basically seeking to overturn the results of the 2016 election, uh, this is a classic sort of um, the people versus the elite ploy. Is that what's going on? That's what they're certainly trying to do. I mean, the line, of course, is that it's a reversing democratic process. I mean, that kind of a, a little professional that uh, Hillary Clinton actually got 3 million votes in Donald Trump.
As uh, trade talks resume in Washington between the US and China, uh, that trade war between the two largest economies uh, could have a devastating effect. And it's been uh, assessed pretty grimly by the World Bank. 30 million people being pushed into poverty. Su Pin Chang uh, is here from our business desk. It's a pretty blunt number. Where have they got it from? Yeah, so we have to remember we've followed the many twists and turns of the trade war between the US and China, but sometimes we forget the cars we drive, the gadgets in your pocket, they're made from parts made from around the world. Now, the World Bank is saying that this tit-for-tat trade war has consequences for many developing economies if global investment is affected. So this will lead to lower growth and less prosperity for all in this worst case scenario. And is this basically about the fears of tariffs, trade barriers going up? Is that what's causing this? Yes and no. So there are many problems, but this report is 300 pages. It does offer some solutions as well. And it also focuses on how to get developing economies into these global networks of production. So one interesting statistical report is that one day's delay at the border in getting stuff from the factory gate to the next destination is as damaging as a tariff of 1%. This is particularly important on the African continent, where more than half the jobs depend on agriculture. So Penny Goldberg, she's the World Bank's chief economist, she told me delays in the time is transport transport is very expensive so that's it that's one of the reasons that we call for liberalizing the sector so that there is more competition lower prices so all these buyers are in some sense more important than tariffs and, and we put a lot of emphasis on those that was penny goldberg there pretty blunt stats from the world bank thank you su pin chang now switching to a plant-based diet is one of the ways to help fight climate change, that's according to the UN, and we've heard that before. The organization says lowering meat consumption, especially in countries such as the United States or the United Kingdom, would help reduce greenhouse gas emissions that uh, come from livestock like cows. But what if we could fight climate change and still eat meat? From the United States uh, of Georgia, Hannah Long Higgins reports on the cows, uh, on the cows that a part of the solution, not the problem. Take a listen. I was in love with industrial cattle farm. That, that was what I did, was what I lived for, I was good at it. Will Harris is a fourth generation cattle farmer in Bluffton, Georgia. For most of his life, he farmed cattle the industrial way. It was all about how many pounds of beef I could produce for the least possible amount. Using all the tools that reduction of science had given me. Chemical fertilizers, pesticides, hormone implants, so they're getting out of eggs, etc. It's the way most food in America is produced. A system where livestock are confined indoors under controlled conditions in order to maximize profit and increase production. Industrial agriculture breaks the cycles of nature. Cows were born to grow the grains, hogs were born to grow the chickens were born to scratch and pay. With the well-being of its animals, we'll have a change of heart about 25 years ago.
all producing good grass food. They're actually benefiting the crops. They're actually pulling their own greenhouse gases as opposed to emitting the greenhouse gases. This is part of the Yes, you heard him correctly. Will's farm is storing more carbon in its soil than his pasture used cows and did during their lifetimes. It was an unintended consequence, a positive unintended consequence. The United Nations estimates at least 14% of all global greenhouse gases come from livestock, and cattle are a big part of that. But Will Harris argues it's not the cow, it's the how. Between grazing periods, the land is given time to regenerate. It's that method that makes white oak pastures six times more carbon efficient than any other average American beef production system. You can compare our model to vegetable-based protein, imitation meat, which I think is fine because we think we want to eat, but I'm offended when that's marketed as butter for the environment than what I think. Plant-based products do produce carbon. It's less carbon than industrial beef, but it still contributes to climate change. But whale's beef is different. If the consumer wants to make the mitigation of climate change, it's not about eating no meat or less meat. It's about eating the right meat. If you eat the right meat, you're part of the Industrial companies argue White Oak's model of regenerative grazing is not sustainable at scale. And Will agrees, but that doesn't mean it can't be replicated in communities around the world. I'm very glad that I made the change. My land is healthier, my animals are healthier, my community is healthier. You know, people have been talking about climate change for 20 plus years, but suddenly it's called traction. And I, I think it's good. I hope it's not too late. That report there by Hannah Long Higgins. Only way to end a report like mm. that. Yeah, it should have started like that as well. Uh, 25 minutes past the hour. Now let's talk about birds. Birds in the news. Uh, conservationists saying that emperor penguins in Antarctica are in considerable danger. Also in considerable danger, a much less popular bird in Madrid, the Spanish capital. It's a parrot. It's called the monk parakeet. Very pretty, I have to say. The problem is it's rather noisy and rather numerous, and apparently locals in Madrid have had enough of them. So they're going to hunt, trap, and sterilise them. Ooh, sounds a bit uh, a, a bit grievous. Our reporter in Madrid is Guy Hedgecombe. Guy, how bad and for whom is the parakeet problem? Well, there are a lot of parakeets here. Um, just three years ago, there were 10,000 uh, counted in Madrid, and now there are 13,000. So, as you can tell, the numbers are growing very fast. And pretty much anywhere in Madrid, uh, in any part of Madrid, you'll find parakeets, even right in the city centre, even those touristy areas right in the middle of Madrid. Now, these parakeets are um, originally from Argentina um, and Uruguay, um, they became popular as pets back in the 1980s and 90s, and people started importing them to Spain uh, by the thousand. Um, and Blas Molina from the wildlife organisation SEO BirdLife explained to me more about how they ended up on the streets of Madrid uh, after becoming popular pets. Because they make a noise which many people who bought these birds as pets found unpleasant, a lot of them were released into the city, and also some birds have escaped. And because they have managed to adapt to these urban areas, and they found the right food and conditions, their numbers have increased enormously. 
Now that noise that Blas Molina mentioned is very hard to ignore and that is a real problem with the monk parakeet. That seems to really irritate people here in Madrid. I think we have a clip of a, a monk parakeet in action to give you an idea. Quite like that yeah. in the studio, but that's just one. I imagine multiplied by thousands. That's pretty awful. But uh, what's interesting is kind of uh, the effect that they've had. Are, are, are they sort of like moving a problem on? Are they replacing, I don't know, what do you call them? Native birds? I mean, uh, what, what happens? Well, there are other issues as well, apart from the noise. I mean, environmentalists say that the, that the monk parakeet undermines bio, biodiversity by stripping trees um, in order to make their nests. So, you know, they, wherever they are, trees are stripped of bark and, and twigs, and that causes problems in terms of biodiversity. But those nests, by the way, can be enormous. Um, and although nobody's yet been hurt, Madrid City Hall has warned of the danger of the nests falling on people's heads. So that's another problem. But there's also the fact that the monk parakeet is very aggressive towards other species, and that can mean that other weaker birds, for example, are pushed away. Um, and they do seem to be a growing problem for the people of Madrid. There were nearly 200 complaints about parakeets between January and August of this year, um, and that's almost as many complaints uh, as the whole of last year. So it does seem to be a, a, a growing problem for the people of Madrid. Wow, thank you very much indeed. Uh, Guy Hedgeco in Madrid uh, telling us more about the... Now, that is a monk parakeet. In London, uh, we've been invaded by... And they're very popular. Lots of people love them. Rose-ringed parakeets. Uh, many amusing conspiracy theories and urban myths about where they come from. Uh, no, they were not first released by Jimi Hendrix. Here on the BBC World Service, we explore a shared dilemma. Does humankind have a God-given dominion over the natural world? That is the story that for the last 2,500 years has shaped Western thinking. Is there a moral duty for us to prevent animal suffering? In one life you are a human being, but in the next life you will be the dog or the cow. Are we here to cultivate and steward the earth? Our climate problem is actually on our plates. It's in the food industry. As we witness the destructive impact of people on the environment. Four writers explore our attitude to other creatures. Continuing with author Panache Chikomadze. It's our greatest obstacle to understanding another animal, their inability to communicate as we do. Episode 2, The Animals and the Linguists. Dominion at bbcworldservice.com. This is Newsday uh, from the BBC with Lawrence Pollard and Carney Shab coming up. On the way, $14 billion. That's what a conference in France wants to raise in the fight against the killer diseases that are combined TB, HIV and malaria. We talked to a campaigner who lost three of her babies to that mm. peril. Yes, also uh, the aftermath of the BBC Sex for Grades investigation. That's coming up. Two lecturers in Ghana and Nigeria have now been suspended. BBC News with Neil Nunes. The White House says it won't cooperate with the impeachment process against President Trump. A White House lawyer said it was unconstitutional and partisan. The Democratic House Speaker Nancy Pelosi responded by saying President Trump was not above the law. A spokesman for President Erdogan has said the Turkish military and the free Syrian army will cross the Syrian border shortly. Fahrettin Altun said Kurdish militants there could either defect or Ankara would have to stop them, as he put it, disrupting Turkey's struggle against Islamic State militants. The U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo has condemned the violence during recent protests in Iraq and called on the government in Baghdad to exercise maximum restraint. Anti-government demonstrations which began at the start of the month have seen more than 100 people killed. The Irish Prime Minister Leo Varadkar has warned it will be very difficult to secure a Brexit deal at the end of the month when the UK is due to leave the EU. He suggested the language around the discussions had turned toxic in some quarters. The champion Australian trainer Darren Ware has been charged with animal cruelty offences after electronic devices used to shock horses into running faster were discovered at his stables. Mr. Ware trained the Melbourne Cup winner of 2015. 
Conservationists are calling for more to be done to save emperor penguins in Antarctica. Scientists have estimated a significant fall in the numbers of the birds if the sea ice where they rear their young melts because of global warming. Nine previously unpublished novellas by the French author Marcel Proust go on sale for the first time today. The novellas explore what were considered risque themes for the era, such as physical love and homosexuality. BBC News. Many thanks, Neil, for the latest. Hello, this is Carney and Lawrence with Newsday. A uh, very warm welcome. We're going to go live to Zambia in a moment. Hear a very personal take on the fight against some of the world's most deadly diseases. Also, in the next half hour, we'll be uh, going to Uganda, hearing allegations of minorities being hunted down. And the latest from Nigeria on the sex for grades scam. Also, talking frankly, in Kenya, plus Matthew Kenyon with the sport. It's Newsday. start in uh, Zambia. Tuberculosis, or TB, is the major cause of HIV-related death. That's why the deadly combination of the two are often called the twin epidemics. Along with malaria, they are the major public health uh, crisis currently ravaging the world. Uh, and the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, TB and malaria, they, they're holding a conference in Lyon, France, to try and raise more funds to help eradicate these infections. It's a two-day meeting, and the fund is asking for 14 billion US dollars. In a report published to coincide with the conference, the medical charity MSF says a decline in international funding and the shifting of the financial burden to affected countries is in danger of reversing any gains. We can speak now to a Zambian HIV activist, Connie Wadenda. She joins us now uh, from Lusaka. Welcome to the program, Connie. Thank you so much. Um, we understand you lost three of your babies to uh, HIV, but at that time you didn't even know that you had had HIV, did you? Uh, no, uh, I didn't know that I had HIV, but uh, later on in, uh, in life I had tested for HIV, and I went back to the hospital, they told me that they had actually tested my children, but did not tell me the results. Wow, when you heard that, how did you feel? Oh, it's one very bad experience, really. Uh, it's something that you wouldn't wish on another person. Uh, and you know, you get attached to these children even before they were born. Absolutely. And then, yeah, and then losing them at different ages after you've had uh, that connection with them, touching them, loving them, feeding them, and then suddenly you watch them uh, wasting away slowly. And then, as a mother, you can't, you, you fail to do anything about it, and no one can do anything about it because then there was no treatment in Zambia. It was really something that was uh, heartbreaking because I watched them go away slowly until the end. And there must have been an, an immense amount of anger there because, as you said, the the, the hospital knew about this, but they didn't mm -hmm. they didn't bother telling you. Uh, 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 I wouldn't really blame the hospital mm. so much because uh, there was a lot of. Uh, uh, misconceptions, there was a lot of stigma around and then people didn't really fully understand what HIV or what AIDS was all about. So I think they were also taking some precautions uh, for not telling me. Uh, maybe they, they figured for my life, they didn't know how I was going to react. Uh, we've heard, we had people that actually were committing suicide after they were told that they were HIV positive. Wow. I wanted dip into that stigma in a moment, but you have a healthy daughter now, Lubona, uh, yes. and this was after you started taking the antiretroviral. Yes, that was uh, almost like 16 years after I lost my, because in, in the year 1996, I lost two children in the same year, and uh, I stayed for 16 years without having a child, but later on in life, I realized that uh, I, I was a treatment for some time. And uh, I was able to uh, keep my my HIV in check. It was actually undetectable. And I knew after working in the clinics and uh, the HIV clinic that I would not be able to pass on the HIV if my, my HIV was not detected. Sure. And yeah, and, and I decided to give it a try. And Connie, when it comes to Zambia, is that when you talk about stigma there, what's it like now? Are, are, are people still reluctant to talk about it? And because you try and you 
you're you're part of that. Uh, you're one of those campaigners that goes around telling people how important it is to take uh, the antiretrovirals. Yeah, well, with a lot of education, people will really uh, fully understand what it is now when they can talk about it freely. But like you know, in every society, mm -hmm. there are others that will always be resistant to some things. So we cannot fully say that uh, we have eradicated stigma. Sure. There are, there are some uh, issues of stigma which are uh, placed somewhere, but uh, a lot of people now talk about it freely, and that has really helped when it comes to treatment and care. And very briefly, when when you look at the facts that you know international fun funding is on the decline, why is it so important that governments and donor organisations keep to this increasing their funding for things like this? From a personal point of view, it, you would say that it is really crucial, isn't it? Yes, it is. Uh, personally, I'm dependent on medication. So I am healthy right now because of the medication. And if that is taken away from me, I will not be able to live long and to see my baby grow. And you wouldn't have been able to have a healthy baby girl, Lavona. Well, thank no. you very much for joining us. Thank you for your time. and Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you. That's Connie Mudenda there, Zambian HIV activist, talking to us from Lusaka. <laughs> Twenty-two minutes to the hour, Newsday with Lawrence and Connie. Let's talk now about persecution of minorities in Uganda, particularly sexual minorities, members of the LGBTI community. Um, uh, the activists in Uganda say that uh, such people are being hunted down. Uh, pretty dramatic language. It comes after the killing of a gay activist over the weekend. And uh, also in the background, there are political moves to revive or retable the uh, now uh, sort of, um, uh, well, much written about, rather notorious anti-homosexuality bill dating back to 2014. Joining us now is uh, Paul Kanyamu, uh, who is an activist, transgender activist, who fled to Kenya a few months ago, fearing for his safety. Uh, Paul, welcome to the program. Could you just explain the circumstances which forced you to flee? Why people are talking of being hunted now? Now, thank you. I am by name Paul Kanyam, uh, a transgender. I'm currently um, here in Kenya at Kakuma Refugee Camp, and I'm a Ugandan by nationality. Uh, I was discovered by my parents how I am gay. I was beaten to pulp, stamped by my parents, and I'm a homophobic community. Uh, my parents disowned and chased me away from home. And all my relatives stood and said they must be killed just because I am gay. Uh, simply because in our culture in Uganda, and basically in my own region where I come from, in my culture, being gay is seen as a curse and outcast. So that alone was, wasn't going to be tolerated, and my parents and relatives rose up and said they must be killed just because found out how I am And Paul, you're now in, you, you've crossed over into Kenya. Uh, do you feel safer in Kenya? I am not safer in Kenya in two years. I, I am not safe in Kenya. Reason being where I am right now, uh, Kenya as a country of recent past laws that criminalize homosexuality. So, and where I am here, uh, we are in Kakuma refugee camp and found in Trukana land. And as I speak now, the Trukana chief or the governor, Mr. James, has spoken to the UNHCR of Kenya to vacate all the LGBTI persons from Kakuma refugee camp and take them to another country or close and called Kenya that doesn't accept some of the oh. And another thing, while I become as a transgender, I'm always belittled, I'm worked by my fellow refugees. Just because of the way I am, how I identify myself as a transgender. Right. Hang on a minute, Paul. Uh, the, the, listen, Paul. Paul you, you just said something yes, that really, that really sort of got my attention. You're saying yes. that the authorities in Kenya are specifically saying that no homosexuals should be allowed in refugee camps on their territory, and that therefore you should be moved. Am I right? Is that what you're saying? Yes, you're very right. And the yes, basis for this is what? Is there a law? that they have in Kenya that means that that is the case? Yes, the laws of Kenya say for homosexuality should be tolerated and just because of the laws just like to people that's the latest homosexuality. Right, now hang on, you, 
you've you've had to leave your home uh, and indeed your family because of your sexuality. You've now fled to what you hoped might be safety in Kenya. What happens now if the Kenyan government is saying that people like you should leave? Where will you go? I'm totally worried. My life is in imminent danger as I can feel right now. My life is in danger. And as a transgender here, uh, the refugees usually mock me. They beat me sometimes. They treat me well. I'm in the line of food. And some people are threatening me with their threats. So I really don't know. My life is in danger. I can say all of it's a heartbreaking story that you tell. Can I can I ask? Um, I mean, you're in a refugee camp, and most people who are fortunate not to be in that situation would imagine that the priorities are getting food, getting shelter. Why do people target you in the refugee camp? Uh, how do they know that you are transgender of a, of a sexual minority? Well, we are eligible. I hear we identify as LGBTI here, and just like you know how LGBT is, uh, transgender in my photo is uh, on the cloudy black. The photo, they like putting on cars, they like putting on some clothes, they have rainbow colors, so uh, these people are aware of the rainbow colors that they are for. Right, okay, so, so there's a signifier there that they understand. Do you have other people in your situation? Do you have a community that supports you, or are you on your own in the camp? What can I be? Are you on your own in the camp as a as a transgender? Uh, do you have others with you? Is there a community to, to support you? Well, I'm with others in the camp. I tell you the truth, and we are under UNHCR. What's called UNHCR brought us to this camp, but they promised us protection as they were being high. But it is not the case. We are in prison and we are not safe at all. And we have tried to complain to any error, but there is nothing that has been done, unfortunately. Well, listen, you raise a very important issue, which I think we should maybe look into. Paul, thank you. Uh, best wishes as well. You don't know where you're going to go next. Obviously, you don't want to be where you are, but you don't know where you could go for safety. For sure, I don't know. Well, Paul, thank I don't you. Know where I'm Paul, thank you very much. A terrible story told to us by Paul.